Good evening, everyone, and for those who are watching the tape, we are now continuing with our classes after a few weeks of a break. And in the church, after adults are baptized, they enter into a special new group called the mystagogia, the unfolding of the mysteries. In the early church, especially in the first and second century, there were so many misunderstandings of what the Christians were doing. In my homily on Sunday, I talked about this whole concept of the breaking of the bread. So in the end of the first century, you have a wonderful, it's called a dialogue between a theologian and the emperor. And it's very interesting because it's anything but a dialogue. The emperor hears that the Christians are drink, drinking the blood of Christ and eating the flesh of Christ. So he accuses them of cannibalism. And Justinian, the theologian, basically answers back, not so politely, telling him, you're a stupid idiot. And so we call it not the dialogue, but the diatribe between the emperor and, and this bishop theologian. But it was to clarify misconceptions. Now, because of this idea that they were dabbling in cannibalism, they would often not tell the catechumens many things because they had no idea if there were secret soldiers in the group of the catechumens. Even 2,000 years ago, we had those problems. And so the catechumens in the traditional rites would be with the community in the beginning of the Mass, up until the collection. After we got your money, we would dismiss the catechumens, which is why the collection is taken where it's taken, not because we were getting money, but it's because up to that point, the catechumens and the community of the baptized all sat together. Then the catechumens were dismissed, and they always sat in one section. They would be dismissed, and then the Mass began. So the catechumens' first experience of the Eucharist was on the night they were baptized, and the ceremonies were always at night, in secret, in what are called house churches. They didn't have church buildings as we know them, but they were the house churches. And so here, the, the main idea is that each group came in and uh, the, the catechumens then were dismissed and then they went to Mass. So now, the question came, when did they learn about the Mass? That's what you're in now, the mystagogia. It was an extended catechumenate but it's called the opening of the mysteries, and it's particularly aimed at those who were not baptized and are now baptized. And so it's only, as you saw in the outline, it's five classes. I have reduced it. I think in the, um, in the rest of the parish, it's about three months. I'm merciful. Uh, so I know what you have to know, and I also will give you in the last class many other assistances or helps on things to still learn. So that's where, where we are right now. So we'll begin the class, and now that most of us are here, we'll begin with the prayer, the Our Father. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, for those, of, um, for those at home, there are people in class, live people. Uh, from, uh, from the class that were baptized. And you will have on your desks a couple of things which I'll hold up 
and we may try to attach to the lecture tomorrow. The first is a very simple cheat sheet. When you go into church, you always are wondering when do people stand, sit, kneel, whatever. This gives you everything. Just don't pull it out during Mass because the people who think, will, they'll come over and take a picture. This is only for you. If they don't know, okay. But this helps you because you really don't know. We, we do have commentators that will say, please stand, please sit, whatever. But this gives you an idea when in the Mass we stand, we sit, we kneel. Those are the three postures. And so we, at the entrance, we stand. And we stay standing until the priest sits. So that means from the time we start the song, the procession in, um, during Sundays of Easter, we incense the altar and the Paschal candle. And then the priest says the opening prayers, finishing with the let us pray prayer, which is called the collect, collecting everyone together. And then he sits, when he sits, you sit. It's very rare that the priest sits and everyone stands. Very, very rare. So the, in general, if the priest sits, you sit. Then you stand for the gospel. Why? Because the gospel is Christ speaking to us. The first readings are the Old Testament and New Testament. But out of reverence, we stand because we're being talked to through the priest by Christ himself. So that's why he greets us, the Lord be with you, and we respond, and then we have the reading of the gospel. When the priest finishes the gospel, everyone sits for the homily. It's also more comfortable to sit when you're falling asleep, which happens during the homily. I will say, Please, um, you're going to get a class, a special class on confession. Falling asleep during the priest's homily is not of the level of a sin. It's not. I'm not offended. No, well, maybe. Anyway, but I tell people, uh, I said this recently to someone who came in and said, Father, I can't help it. The minute you start preaching, I fall asleep. And um, I'm not that, you know, self-centered. I simply said, maybe God's telling you something. You need to sleep. And if my voice helps that for a few minutes, fine. Better still, play tapes of my homilies if you can't sleep at night. Uh, I, I tell that to parents. Years ago, someone told me the only time their baby sleeps well is during my mass. So they have tapes of my voice. Other babies scream, but we now put them in the hall. After the homily, then we stand for the profession of faith and the prayer of the faithful. For the offertory and the collection at that point, we sit. Then we stand during the prayer, pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours, and that leads to the offertory prayer and the preface. Then at the Holy Holy, we, we kneel during the Eucharistic prayer at a particular point. The servers ring a bell. It is when the priest stretches his hands over the chalice in the calling down of the Holy Spirit, then we kneel. And we stay kneeling generally until the, uh, the great amen at the end of the Eucharistic prayer. But here in Hong Kong, we stand at the, when the priest says, the profession of faith, the mystery of faith, and then people stand. Either one is correct. There, just follow what people do. You will see everyone here stands, but there are people that stay kneeling. It's not that they don't know. The tradition is really to stay kneeling until the amen at the end of the Eucharistic prayer. Then you stand for the Our Father, and then after that, as after we have the prayer, Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world, then they ring the bell again, and it's because we're getting ready for communion, and you kneel for a brief moment to make yourself ready to receive the Eucharist. 
That, that's the reason we do that. It's to give yourself a minute to get yourself in the, you know, your mind, I am going to receive Christ. Unfortunately now, everyone thinks it's the signal, take out your hand uh, sanitizer and start sanitizing vigorously. On that, the hand sanitizer at communion, please don't be liberal because I have to put the host on that palm and if that palm is a minor swimming pool of antiseptic and perfume, I'm getting sick knowing you're going to have to put that into your mouth. So please, I, uh, if you ever watch what we do, we, we use pure alcohol, not even uh, the nice stuff. We, at communion, we have small bottles of pure alcohol. I spray it on my fingers because that's all it's touching. It's really these fingers, these three. Everything else is nowhere near the host. But we keep those clean. And so um, that prevents any, any problem. All you need is a little, little bit, a drop. And basically just on the palm, because the Eucharist will be placed in your palm, your left palm, and you take it with your right hand, okay? Then you stay kneeling after communion and sitting to just pray in thanksgiving and then stand for the final prayer and the dismissal. So here you have your little instruction manual for Mass. Uh, just another little gift for getting through the catechumenate. Now I'm going to go into a much more intense topic. Up until the 3rd of April, you were not Catholics. And because of that, there are certain rights and privileges that you were not obliged to have. You could basically do whatever you wanted. Now, once you become a Catholic, now there, is, there are both obligations and rights that you get the moment I baptize you, one of the changes, one of the ontological changes is that you are now a full member of the Catholic Church. And you are now given rights and you have to take on obligations. And it is amazing. Most Catholics have no idea and so I have given all of you now, you will see the uh, landscape-sized paper which says the Code of Canon Law. And I'd ask you to be looking at that now. The Code of Canon Law is this. This is the Code of Canon Law. This is the body of all the laws of the Roman Catholic Church. As I have told many of you, too many times. I am a lawyer in this form of law. I am also a judge in the tribunal that deals with this law. And I had to, uh, we had a famous professor who used to always tease us because the law school for canon law is, sim is similar to any civil law school. In my country, graduate school is usually two years to get a master's degree. Law school is always three. But the law students, civil law in the United States, cheat. At the end of three years, their degree is called a JD, Doctor of Law. We don't cheat in canon law. We do three years, and we call ourselves JCL, License of Canon Law. Now, I, I have friends of mine who are lawyers and they all call themselves, well, I'm a doctor of law. I said, yeah, yeah. I studied just as long. I'm not a doctor of law. I, if I studied another two or three more years, I would have the rank of a doctor of law and have a much nicer cap and gown at graduation. Uh, but nobody really cares. Once you're a lawyer, nobody looks at your qualifications. So here, the law of the church. This is what it is. This is what it looks like. The law is written in Latin, as you will see on your notes. There are two columns. The official law is the part in Latin. 
the part in English cannot be used in quoting the law. It's strange. So when I, when I practiced my practice as a judge, and I was showing this today to someone who just had their marriage annulled, they, um, I was showing him the judgment, which we normally never show, but he was shocked about how much Latin is in the sentence I write because I cannot invent the law. My job is to apply the law. And that means I have to know, you don't have that in front of you, the marriage law, which is the dirty part of my book in the middle, very messy. And this, this is now outdated. We all just received three months ago a new translation. And I have to go through the new book and copy all my yellow, red, blue notes into the new one because some of the laws have been changed. The wording has changed. Anyway, the important point, the important point for the church is that I'm giving you the law on the rights and obligations. This is in, uh, the book of law is divided into sec seven fields of law, seven separate areas that we uh, determine in law. The first, like all law, is general norms. So chapter one, book one, is general norms. What is law? How do we apply it? Who is it for? Who does it? Who administers it? What is the weight of the law? All of these very dull topics that we have to sit through. Then we go into book two, and what you're looking at is book two. Book two is called The People of God. The law is for the people of God. And who are they? So come right away in book two, uh, it has the Christian faithful. Do you have Canon 204 in the notes? I, no, I don't think you have them. The very first law, I, I only gave you a part. I'm not hiding anything. Do I have Canon 204? Yeah. OK, so that's the, that defense says who you are. The Christi Fidelis, Christi Fidelis Sunt, Qui, ut pote per patesimum Christo incorporati. Okay, I'm showing off. The Christian people are those who have been incorporated in Christ through baptism. Now you, that's all of you now. You have been incorporated into Christ through baptism. And you are now, the last part of that, in populum dei sunt constituit. You are now constituted part of the people of God. Before you weren't. Now you are. And so this is the first one, and uh, the first part. So in order to become a Catholic, you must be baptized. If you are not baptized, you are not yet a Catholic. I've had this discussion many times. People misunderstand They'll say, oh, I'm a, I'm a Christian. And I will ask, well, uh, were you baptized? And they will say, well, no, but I like Christianity. That's fine. But you're not washed. The baptism for all groups of Christians is the entry right. Without it, you are not baptized. And so, uh, and if I have a doubt, when I'm pouring the water, as I did for all of you, you heard, I, I, for each one, I give your name and I say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. If I have a doubt, I whisper to myself in Latin, if you have not yet been baptized, I baptize you. Because I cannot baptize a person a second time. It's not allowed. But if I have a reasonable doubt, if I'm certain the person has never been baptized, no, no whispering Latin. But we do it in Latin so nobody gets offended. That's the beauty of a second language. So I'll just under my breath go, in case you weren't baptized, I baptize you. So I'm covered, they're covered. If they were baptized, I didn't do anything because I'm putting a doubt into the phrase. Okay. The church is constituted as a society. All law applies to associatus, a community. 
Laws are not made for birds or bees or whatever. Laws are made for people, and so they are for a society. And the church has constituted and organized this world as a society, and it subsists in the Catholic Church. Now, given that, the next one would be what I should have told all of you when you first started. As catechumens, what rights did you have? Pretty much none, except if you died during the catechumenate, you could be uh, buried in a Catholic cemetery. That's about all it gives you. Because you are attached to us because you're wanting to enter. And so the church has, it goes on on, on Canon 206, on part two, subsection two, the church has a special care for catechumens. While it invites them to lead a life of the gospel and introduces them to the celebration of sacred rites, it also grants them various prerogatives which are proper to Christians, such as Christian burial. Now, we, we, we spell that out all over this book. It's up to the priest to actually know. So you have a right as a catechumen to go into the church. I can't say don't go in. You have a right to participate in different ceremonies without receiving communion, of course, or doing other things reserved to the Catholics. You can get married in a Catholic church to, another, to someone who is a Catholic. Some of you did get married here in St. Margaret's, at least one, two, three, four. You were married here too, weren't you? Yeah, one, two, three, four. Jackie, were you? Yeah, you were married somewhere else. You're not married yet. You're all, you're all, you got married here, yes. Uh, you're not, you're, you're the only one here. Eddie. <laughs> and, and John in the back is a different marriage status. So what happens is this. You had the right. That's why we don't say, oh, you're not Catholic. No. And it's not because we want your money for the wedding. No. People think that. As long as one is a Catholic, the other can be married in the church. It's, if we have two non-Christians, two non-Catholics, there is no marriage in the church. But that's one of the, the, the places where that exception is made. The other one comes to, as I mentioned, burial. If you die you are, and you are a catechumen, you have a right to be buried in a Catholic cemetery. But we have to fill out all kinds of documents. If you normally, normally die, Okay. If you die as a Catholic and you want to be buried here in Hong Kong, whether it's cremation, burial on the ground, whatever, in a Catholic cemetery, of which there are four or five, the biggest one, which is closed now, is St. Michael's, right behind the racetrack here. On Hong Kong Island, we also have out in Taiwan, Holy Cross Cemetery, which has got a lot of space still. Then we have St. Raphael's over in Kowloon in Chungchawan. And then we have another cemetery on, uh, in uh, Chungchow uh, Island. I, I, I forget what it's called, but it's there. Now, there, when you want to, if someone in your family dies and the family are Catholic, they have to go to the parish and present three documents. First, a death certificate from the government. We have to know we're burying a dead person. Uh, some of you want to put somebody down in the ground before they have, while they're still breathing. But we have to, we have to certify they're dead. So we need the death certificate. When you, a, a relative dies, make sure you get a dozen copies. You'll need them for all kinds. The next is the one I most love. We need your Hong Kong ID with a bullet hole through your data. They really, they punch it out when you're dead. So one of the things you do with a death certificate, not you, if it's, not, if it's you, it's not your relatives, they go to the registry office with your Hong Kong ID and with your death certificate, and somebody very, very carefully punches a hole through the, the, the chip. And then you have to show us that because there you cease to exist by the Hong Kong government. 
You're no longer tax being taxed. <laughs> Maybe you are. I don't know. And then the third thing we need is to prove you actually lived here. And this is becoming the impossible document because young people do everything online. They don't get bills at home for water, gas, electricity, telephone, the normal things that are sent to your physical address. And it's as if they live under a bridge. Maybe they do. But we have a problem getting this. I had recently, I buried a man who had been in a nursing home for six years. And there is nothing that shows where he was for the last six years because he had had a massive stroke. He was unable to talk, to move. He was being cared for. And his billing, the, the, the family closed down the apartment. He was not going to go back. And then we ran into this problem. What do we do? He, had, he wasn't getting, he, the family were paying bills, but under a different name and a different address. So this is something, you know, always keep something. I have very little that comes to me care of St. Margaret's. And I had to, when I was dealing with a bank here in Hong Kong, they had to come and physically take my picture, both standing at the gate with the sign that says St. Margaret's Church, in my office, and then they demanded a picture of me in my bedroom. I said, for what? I think they were just curious. But the bank demanded all of that for me to have an authorized signature because I'm not registered at St. Margaret's. I'm registered somewhere else on Hong Kong. So, okay. Getting back to this, now we're going to go down. Uh, everything in the church, you have rights and obligations. Rights mean the church owes you these rights, and you have a right to demand them. That's the important point. If you have a right, you have a right to demand it. But at the same time, the church imposes on you through baptism obligations. And so the rights and the obligations come together. This is the same as civil law. The civil law statutes in Hong Kong have both rights and obligations. Taxation is an obligation. It's not a right. It's an obligation imposed. Now, we don't have taxation in the church. Mm -hmm. But we do have down here. We hide it. We use nicer words. You have an obligation to assist the needs of the church. And they will specify, pay for the wine and water, pay for the candles, pay for the hosts, pay for the church, air conditioning. That's everything for worship. Pay for the church's extension of charity. So offerings to help people, second collections. We have one coming up this coming Sunday. That's where that comes. And then sustaining the clergy, keeping the priests alive. Now, that's the one that causes a lot of headaches. But all we say is that's one of the obligations. And there are all these other ones. You have an obligation to stay in the church, not to get baptized and then six weeks later you decide to go somewhere else. You have an obligation to communion, to stay with, within the church. And you have an obligation to fulfill the duties, uh, your duties to the church. What are, what are the obligations of a Catholic? One, go to Mass every Sunday. That's an obligation. If you don't do it, it becomes something you tell the priest. Now, in the last two years, we have been constantly educating people. If the church is closed, it is not a sin you did not go to Mass, because you couldn't. And if, you know, you should, there is not an obligation, on the strictest sense, to watch the Mass, though it was a strong recommendation that you at least try to spend an hour in prayer each week on a Sunday, either watching a Mass or praying or getting a group together and praying. 
And then we also, uh, even now you will see, if you read the Catholic papers, when we reopened the churches with only 30% allowed, what about the other 70%? And we put in it, if you cannot get into the church, go on a weekday when there is plenty of room. We have two masses every morning here. I don't even know what time, but I know they're in the morning. I think 7.30 and 8.15, because I usually am saying Mass at St. Paul's, at Christ the King, and that's at 6.30, 6.40. But here, you can go in the morning. There are Masses all over Hong Kong, morning and evening. So people who want to go more frequently become familiar of the Mass times in different parishes. Some parishes have every evening a Mass, St. Joseph's here, Rosary Church in Kowloon, and a few others. And so people float around. You have a right to go anywhere you want. You have an obligation to go once a week. Okay? You have an obligation to go to confession once a year during the Easter period, which we define very liberally from Ash Wednesday to Pentecost. It comes out to almost four months. Somewhere in that period, every Catholic should go to confession. All of you were just baptized. You're not bound yet. But by next year, yeah. Now, if you go uh, during other times, that's fine. But the obligation is literally during the Easter season. That's when people should go. You should go every month if you can. Right now, again, because of COVID, we cannot use the confessionals in the church because there is no circulation of air. And we have no way of judging who's in there. And the priest is very close to the person. So what we do is we hear confessions in the offices, keeping like this distance of me to all of you. Now, I'm going over to, I'll go over, I'll get back to these uh, obligations. Let me get to the rights. You have a right. You have a right to worship. Now, this comes up when, when you're living in a place where you cannot worship. But Catholics have a right to gather as a community and to worship. And so it's up to the officials of the church, the bishops and priests, together with the laity, to fight to keep this right. In some countries, when I lived in Russia, we couldn't do this for a long time. In the end, we could. But we were meeting in people's apartments, and it was quasi-illegal. You have a right to dignity. No one can enslave you in the church. So you have a right to human dignity, to your name. Going over here. You have an obligation never to harm the reputation of someone else. Now, I, I know this is being taped, and I'm going to go into very dangerous water now. You cannot ruin the reputation of anyone in the church. Willfully destroy them. And we know from here to the computer, this is the great terminator of people's reputations. People destroy each other anonymously, generally, on the internet, writing all kinds of false or quasi-false things. Not, and, and, and uh, it, is, it uh, becomes a sense of uh, a, a way of bullying other people. And so here, the church says, first, you have a dignity to your reputation. You have a right to your reputation. And as a, a Catholic, you have a right not to get involved in destroying the reputation of another person. So it's, it's two sides of the same thing. You have a right to a reputation. And as Catholics, you are obliged not to. Now, that has been totally thrown out the window. We saw that here in St. Margaret's a few months ago. I'm not going to get into that, but many of the parishioners know what happened, where 
things went on Facebook all over the place, protests, letters, you know, and all kinds of garbage. And it affected the entire parish community. It upset the parish community. That broke these laws. And me being a lawyer, my first reaction is the people doing it should have been punished. And there we do have a whole section, all law has crime and punishment. So we have books six and seven. If you do this, this is what happens. You know, so this is going from a, a little, a little uh, verbal censure all the way to excommunication. There are certain crimes people could commit that incur what is called in, in legal terms, late sententiae. By the very fact that they do it, they are excommunicated. They are out of the church. Now, uh, there, um, I once, I, I confess, I was not yet a lawyer. My parish council in a parish where I was, not the council, one individual, tried to get me expelled from Russia. This is when I was a pastor. I knew who the person was. When I was arrested, actually I was arrested three or four times, I became very popular in the police station. But when I was there, I saw some documents on the desk of the lawyers questioning me that came from me. Documents I wrote in Russian to four people. So I knew who one of those four gave these to the police. The documents were nothing. There was nothing in them. But they were twisting them that I was doing something as a foreigner to Russian citizens that was bad, whatever. Following week, after I had been rudely arrested, dragged out of my house, taken to a police station, and then put on trial, you know, it, this was like a, it was a horrible thing. At the end of it all, the following Sunday, I was in my church. And the guy who did all this walked into my church as if nothing had happened. And I admit, I, one of my favorite passages in the New Testament is when Jesus lost his temper. Because if Jesus did it, I can do it. And when Jesus did it, he turned tables over and whipped people and everything else. And I thought, hey, why not? So what did I do? There is a famous movie of the 1960s called Beckett, the story of the life and murder, martyrdom, of the bishop Thomas Beckett, who was the bishop for King Henry. And at one point in the movie, the king, this is a famous play that became also a movie. And in the movie, the, bishop, the, the king says, will anyone rid me of this churchman? You know, he just says it out loud. So what do they do? They take that as a command to murder him. And so they go into the cathedral and murder Thomas Becket. And what happens is that then there is an excommunication. And in the movie, they dr dramatize this excommunication. They take the paschal candle, that big candle I used at your baptism. They take it turn it over upside down, smash it into the ground, utter something about your name backwards in Latin, whatever, and then throw it over and say, you are out. So I did that. I remembered the movie. It's not in any liturgy book. But I went up, took the candle, that famous one that I had hand painted, as all of you heard, with fingernail polish. It, was, it needed to be broken. So. I smashed it down, threw it on the ground, grabbed the guy by the neck, dragged him out to the door of the church, kicked the door open. It was snowing. It's, you know, Siberia. It's freezing cold. I threw him out. And everyone inside was. Now, then I, I did, I was merciful. I then grabbed his coat and hat and threw that out too. <laughs> then I went back, and his son and daughter in law were still sitting there, and they looked at me, and I go, you better go, or I'll do it to you too. So they all left, and I never saw them again. Now, I, I knew the man was a spy, uh, what we called an informant. 
His whole role was to inform the police about me, and I got rid of him. Big deal. I didn't excommunicate him because he was not a Catholic. I can't, but that was, that's a technical problem. It was very dramatic, and everyone in the church thought, don't mess with this guy. Now, I haven't done that here, don't worry. Uh, but here, it's because, again, this man tried to destroy me, and in destroying me, destroy the church, the community. So here, that's going back. Now, you have a right. You, you have a right to make known your views. I love when people say, I'll, people will come to me and say something, and I say, well, go tell the pastor. Oh, I can't do that. You have a right to. And he has an obligation to listen to you. You have a right to express your views, even when they disagree. And the pastors have an obligation to listen to you. They don't have to agree with you, and they don't have to do what you want. But there is this give and take. Is that clear? You have a right to express an opinion. You have a right to associate. You don't need my permission to form a prayer group. You don't need my permission to form a Bible study group. You can ask for our blessing or whatever. It's polite. But you don't need it. If you want to form something much bigger, then you need permission. But on a, low, a small level, you don't need that. If you want to gather a group of friends and go do something from St. Margaret's or whatever, you don't need our permission if it's not going to cause a problem. So that's, again, you have the right to do this, to make your, new, uh, your views uh, known. You have a right to receive the sacraments. Now this was taken away in the last couple of months because while you have a right to it, we couldn't do it. This was the struggle the priests and the bishop had because you have a right to demand the communion as long as you're not in a state of sin. You have the right uh, here and you have the, ah, you have the right to good preaching. How many times are you asked your opinion about the priest's homily? I don't ask, man. But, you know, we, we do had, we had that feature. We stopped it where people could do thumb, thumbs down on the preaching, uh, the, the famous uh, YouTube and, and Facebook thing. And it was driving us crazy because somebody would have one of their followers put thumbs down against another priest, you know, 15 of them. Then we figured out who they were. You know, some people don't know you can do that. So, okay, you have a right to good preaching. If the preaching is bad, say it. You know, um, the priest has, a, ob has an obligation to prepare a homily. He's not there to walk out on Sunday, oh, okay, time to talk for 10 minutes. Uh, the, one of the reasons I have my homilies printed is for that reason. I don't make them up. I did once where the reader of the second reading literally took my homily and walked back to their seat with it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, now what? I, I, I got up there, it was gone. And we had no idea where it went. I thought it was a plot, a conspiracy by the parishioners to just get me not to preach. But it was, they, they literally were picking up something and they took my homily with it, which is now why I hide it, so they can't do it. Another time uh, in my home parish, I was preaching at my 25th anniversary as a priest. I had a beautiful homily written, one of my best ones. And I had it folded and I put it in the seat where I would sit at mass. The priest at the previous mass when over time, and we have these portable microphones that have to be switched from priest A to priest B. So it's a microphone here and in your pocket. This guy was you know, very slow, blah, blah, blah. And I was sitting there saying, give me the microphone, I wanna get started. So he went back into the church to gather some notes at the chair and took my homily and left. 
And then I get to the homily and there is nothing. That's the only homily in my life as a priest that I completely faked. It was still good, nobody knew. But, uh, or they just, they were too kind not to say something. So here, you have a right to good preaching. So if, if, a, preach is, if a priest is preaching things that you don't want to hear, if he gets political, if he goes too much one way or the other, you have a right, not in public, you don't stand up and shout him down, to gently on the side say, please, I have a right to good preaching. Now, of course, it depends. Does the priest have the gift of good preaching? That's two things. You have a right uh, here to freely, you have a right to Christian education. That's what this is. The RCIA is a right. And so when I came here, that's why I started it. Because the Christian faithful have a right to learn about their faith. It's also why I don't limit it to catechumens. Any Christian has the right to update. And so people come to the classes. And they have, a, I, I can't say no, I don't want to do it. I have an obligation to do it. There's a whole set of obligations for priests, which I didn't put there on purpose. You have a right to freedom of conscience. You have a right to have your own conscience, but it's formed in the teachings of the church. You have a right to freely choose, quote, your state in life. I choose to be single. I choose to be married. I choose to be a priest or a nun. It is not that I am told I'm going to marry this one or that one, or someone who wants to be single, single and then puts up with all the aunties going, what are you, crazy? Where's the grandchildren? What are you doing? I have a young man right now who is discerning a vocation. Now, a, a person discerning a vocation means he is thinking about, should I be married? Should I stay single? Should I be a priest? It's a very difficult decision. Most Catholics don't go through that. Their decision is, should I be married? Should I be single? And unfortunately, in society, being single is not considered a good thing. So I, I see enough. Um, I, lately, as I mentioned even yesterday in my homily, I am now addicted to watching Korean soap operas that go on forever and ever and ever. And so many of them are arranged marriages that don't work out where the couple have no say on who they're marrying. It's all decided by other people. And, and, and you see how their lives get all messed up. Here, you have a free, the church, if I ever suspect someone is coming to get married and there is a gun to their back or something like that, uh, those of you who have been married by me, you had the question, the priest asks, are you here of your own free will? And you have that one moment just before you say the vows, no, I am not here of my own free will. Then, you know, then we'll, you'll deal with the, the banquet and all that washed away. Uh, but here, that's the reason we ask. I recently annulled a marriage of a man who was forced to marry the woman he married. Absolutely forced. And we had witnesses. He had no intention of marrying her but his life was put in danger. For women, in many societies, they have nothing to say with the guy there. The first time they see him is at the altar. The traditional way why the bride is veiled, it's big surprise. After you say the vows, then you unveil and it's like, whoa, what happened? Which is why I insist the veil be open before they even start. In case he has a chance to run, run now. No, now again, it's in the traditional customs. Even in in the custom here, the bride was kept covered, uh, and and the groom had no idea who it was until it was over. Then it's the big surprise. I recently had a bride who was a twin. I didn't know she was a twin. 
I had no idea because it's not on the questions. Her twin sister came to sign another document and I started getting very impatient saying, what kind of a game are you playing? I need a witness, not you. And she said, I am the witness. I said, you can't be the witness. You're the bride. And she goes, no, I'm her sister. And where? There is, they are identical. And they had a third sister a year older. They could pass for triplets. So the day of the wedding, my big joke was I asked the bride to show me her Hong Kong ID. So I knew the right one was getting married. And now the, we have the big one, and I teased some of you on your, I did, teased you on your wedding day, because you never see the bride and groom until they're, they're always covered. I had a wedding Saturday, Friday. Friday, Saturday, I forget what day. I never saw the groom's face. And I had never seen the bride's face. I just saw eyes for four months. I saw from here down, I mean here up. And I've had some where I'll say, are you really the person? Because we don't see anything until the day of the wedding. Then it's a big shock. So anyway, you have a right not to those kind of weddings. You have a right to be married the way you want in the church. And therefore, you have a right to a wedding. Now, here in Hong Kong, that's the headache. Yes, you have a right to a wedding. Not in St. Margaret's. There you have to get on a list and, and be on the first caller. All of you who did it know what it's like to get on the list for St. Margaret's. You have to be up early in the morning with seven or eight people, all with the number of the office at 9 o'clock. So you get your name in there first, especially in November, December, January, February, the big months. Okay. What are the other ones? Uh, you have a right to defend yourselves. You have a right to defend, your, not in a fight, but it comes up again in the right of self-defense of a nation. You have the right to defend yourselves. You are not to be passive, okay? That, that's something that has to be made clear. I think I, I've, I'm condensing everything I've given to you in the notes, just, just to make it um, clearer for all of you. Because I separated out the obligations and the rights. You have an obligation. Ah, when you get married, all of you are Catholics. Well, all of you are married except you. Uh, so you're the only one that's going to have a problem. Uh, but all of you as Catholics, you must get married in a church in front of a priest or deacon with two witnesses and using the books the church demands. You are required as a baptized Catholic to get married in church. If you don't, your marriage is licit but invalid. And therefore, you have to go through a second wedding called a validation. And some of you have gone through that with me, and you know what it is. It can be big, it can be tiny, it could be in the middle of the night, it could be whatever. The idea is we are validating what was a civil marriage. We are now making it a Catholic marriage. Why? One of you is Catholic. As long as there is one Catholic or one Christian, they are bound by this rule. Now, um, so that is on the obligations, marriage. You have a right to have children. That's another one. A government cannot tell you no. As a Catholic, you have a right to have children. How many you have, I don't get involved. I joke about it for those of you in my marriage course. I have teased a few of you when we come to the question, the third question at the, uh, before you exchange vows. Are you willing to have children? And I occasionally throw a number because I know you can't say anything at that point. So I'll say, are you willing to have nine children according to God's law? And you have to answer yes. And then I'll follow you because we have a tape now. <laughs> so that's the, the bad side of videoing weddings. We have everything on tape, including the ones where the groom re, uh, forgets the bride's name 
where the bride forgets the groom's name, things like that. Pictures are much better because you can always get rid of the ones where the mistakes were. Video, you know, I, I've had the, the nightmare of a guy who had the wrong vow. He had the vow of the bride. So he said, I, John, take you, Mary, to be my husband. And, and he goes on with the vow, and then she goes, what? And I went, oh, my God, and I'm, I'm switching the cards. Then I got, all, I got so confused, I handed her the card. She's the wife. I handed the card for the husband. She goes, I, Mary, take you, John, to be my wife. And then she got caught, and I had now done it twice in the same ceremony. And she learned, turned to me and goes, Father Joseph. And I was all mic'd, and I said, well, everyone knows who's running this marriage. We all know who's the boss. So, we, you know, what's your problem? Whose husband, whose wife, you know, as long as we have a husband and a wife, that's all we want. <laughs> Who takes what? Anyway, uh, the Christian faithful have a right not to be punished. Okay, I told you the story of my excommunication of the Russian spy. So he had a right not to be excommunicated by me, but he wasn't a Christian, so who cares? Again, this is how lawyers know how to read the law. It says, the Christian faithful have a right. He's not. He was not a Christian, so he had no rights. The Christian faithful are obliged to assist in the works of the church. The financial, you know, I already did that part. I'm not repeating it because I want to, but yeah. You have, a, you have an obligation. This is another one. You have an obligation to obey your pastors. It doesn't mean blind obedience. It simply means respectful obedience. I can disagree, but I don't do it in a public way. Or I might not like the guy, but I'm not going to be going out shouting him down every chance I have. So th that's what it means. Um, so I think th those, that's everything. There's also the obligations of rights of the late Christian faithful. That's Canon 224 to the end, uh, 224 to 220, 230. Actually, you don't even need 230, but basically what they're saying that you have the right to have freedom of, uh, you, um, you have a right to be given, given jobs by the church, not, not employment, <laughs> given ministries. I don't want people lining up tomorrow and say, Father McCabe said we have a right to get hired, no. You have a right to be readers if you have the qualifications. You can have the right to be Eucharistic ministers and church, the people helping, if you have the qualifications. So usually uh, we ask people after you finish, does someone want to be one of the readers at Mass? And there, a simple qualification is you have to be baptized and in a state of grace and be able, be able to read. Not everyone has that third part. Uh, and so here we uh, announce at different points during the year anyone who wants to be this or that, like people who want to sing in the choir. Yes, you have the right to be able to if you can sing. If you can't sing, eh, you really shouldn't be in the choir. Uh, we, young people, we, once they're confirmed, we bring them into the altar servers. That's, again, the right of the Christian faithful to do that. We don't force them, but they have, uh, we ask them, or we, we recruit them, if you will. And laypersons who, have an, a, a, who excel in certain academic pursuits have the right for, by the church to be sent on for studies in theology. Now here in Hong Kong, we do this limitedly. We allow people to study at Holy Spirit Seminary, getting degrees leading to a baccalaureate in philosophy or theology. So you have a right to that. Now in, in, what it means is that Catholic universities must be open to accepting people for the theological sciences. This is not talking about you know, going for engineering or whatever. This is to study theology. 
you have a right if you are academically qualified to study theology, scripture, philosophy uh, in those fields. Uh, canon law is more complex because to study this, you have to have other qualifications. You have to have also a mastery of Latin, which eliminates most people. Um, my class, I hope none of them are watching my lectures. My class in law school, none of them knew Latin. They were studying Latin while they were studying the law. But I already knew Latin because I had a classical high school education, which was four years of Latin every day for an hour every day. I hated it, but I had no problem reading the law. Uh, and I did a fifth year when I entered the seminary. So I have five years of Latin. Greek, I have two years, uh, for that's scripture studies. Okay, any questions on the rights and obligations? I'm not gonna say who asked the question, so you don't be afraid. Uh, I won't name you to the people. It, or you can ask me at the next class. There will be, I, I will say, at the very end, there will be an open class, not online, of all of you for the final clearing out of questions. And that's when you will get your baptismal certificates. They're being done now. Some of you have gotten callbacks from Dominic. Not, I don't think anyone here. But a few, they didn't have all the correct information. So he's calling people back for that. I, I saw two applications. So at the, they're doing them now. Once they're printed off and I sign them, you get it and just hold on to it. If you ever lose it, you have a right to get it again. That's, uh, you always have a right to your baptismal certificate. And those of you who are baptized, confirmed, and married, all of that is on the certificate. It will all be there. Now, that said, I want to go to one last topic. And um, I'm going to erase everything that's on the board, but you have the notes. Not everything, but I, have, I need some space. You have a third sheet, the hierarchical structure of the church. What is this thing you just joined? This is called, this is what the, uh, this is here for. How do you know the hierarchical structure of the church? We have this book, the Honorario Pontificio, and this has 2021. I got it last week. It's only about 90 euros. It is a weighty book. It's everything you need to know about the Catholic Church. Believe me, the only ones that have this are bishops, cardinals, and lawyers. Nobody else needs it. But in the Vatican, the big joke when I worked in the Vatican, all of us had this. Hardly anyone had a Bible. Now, we're all supposed to be <laughs> working for Jesus in the church, and whenever you needed a Bible to refer to someone, you're running around, no one had one. We all had this. This was our Bible. It tells you who's in charge from first to last and where they are and all their information. That's what this is, the, the annual book. This book tells you what the hierarchical structure of the church is. And I have to show you, there are two parts. You have the structure of the church and then you have the person involved in that structure. There are two different things. So, uh, one of the first things you're going to have is what you have over here. You have the church. Over here you have the Holy See. This is the body of Christ, the church. This is the Vatican. Not the city-state, the government. Because there is a government. And there are ambassadors. And there are diplomatic relations. And there are officials in the government on different levels of the civil service. That's what I was doing. 
So anyway, this is something just to know. You have uh, the church. Who heads the church? The Pope. He is the supreme the head of the Catholic Church. So under here, you have the Pope. Over here, you have the Pope. Here, he is a religious head of a church. Here, he is a head of a government. Though we don't use that, that expression, but that's what it is. Now, under the person of the Pope, you have then all the people in this book by rank. So the first one is going to be the cardinals. And they're also over here. Cardinal equals hinge. I'm off. This is a cardinal, the hinge of a door. The word cardinal is not the same as the bird, the red bird, the cardinal. Cardinal here is a Latin word that means the hinge that supports the door that keeps it working. And the cardinals are the hinges around the pope that basically are his closest advisors. So that's who they are. So you have this, under the structure of the church, you have this college of cardinals. And who the cardinals are, the pope just named a few new ones. But when you have in this book, ooh, I better do this on camera. The book always begins with a picture of who's in charge. So Pope Francis. And then it has the year that's going on. And then after that, you will have all the popes from St. Peter down to Francis, all listed. Then you have the list Sire dei Somi Pontefici Romani. And so here, this is all the, when every pope from existence began, what years they were pope, and this is the official list. So there have been a few fake ones in there. They're not on the list. And that goes all the way up to today to Francesco of Buenos Aires. <laughs> That's his name, Francis of Buenos Aires. Uh, they, all the cardinals from around the 13th century lost their name. Uh, it is traditional for the, for the popes to take a new name. It's traditional. They don't have to, but they do. And this has been going on for centuries. So their, their family name, who they were, the way the Italians do it is they'll always call them by their family name. So Francesco, Papa Francesco, is known as Bergoglio. That's his family name. Wojtyla was Pope John Paul II. And then you have Pope um, uh, 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 Benedict XVI. Cardinal Ratzinger, so he was known as Ratzinger. Uh, th and that's all in here. What's the family name? So we know, I, I could go all the way back to maybe the 17th century with the family names of the popes. And they all have a coat of arms. Okay. Now after that, they also have their titles. And then, uh, so you'll have Jorge Maria Bergoglio. That's, the, that's currently the pope. And then we'll have, where is he born? Who, where, how did he get ordained? Uh, when was he made a bishop, etc., etc.? They don't put down the day he did this to me in public, but that was around the same time. In, uh, it, uh, it was 1997. That's when I met him. My infamous five minutes of fame, where he came up to me and did this, and I just grabbed the finger and went, nice to meet you. Uh, you know, I had no idea what he was complaining about something. Um, but he was, he was only an auxiliary bishop, so I was not being disrespectful. I did say to him, do you know who I am? And he kind of looked at me. I said, why are you even talking to me? Uh, I have nothing to do with Argentina, but I happen to be in Buenos Aires. Okay. Then you have the College of Cardinals, all that listed, not important. You know, there are seven... Traditionally, there were seven cardinal bishops. Francis just upped the number to 12 for whatever reason. 
And then you have cardinal priests, cardinal deacons. It simply means they're all priests, they're all bishops. But they have these three ranks because of the job they have as a cardinal. A cardinal deacon has a very high prestigious job. A cardinal priest is what most of them do. They are in charge of a diocese. So Cardinal Tong and Cardinal Zen are both cardinal priests. And then you have cardinal deacons who are the ones who only work in the Vatican government. So they are doing a service. They're not in charge of a church. And then you have under the Vatican side, you have cardinals, and then you have this thing called a nuncio. A nuncio is a diplomat. And I say this, it is not his name, it is a title. Because there is a nuncio, a friend of mine, who used to work in Malaysia, and he had all these women who were friends of mine down there, they thought his name was Nuncio. And they were going, oh yes, an Archbishop Nuncio. I go, what? No, his name is Murphy. He's an American, what? But they, because people didn't know, Nuncio is just the title. He is an ambassador, and therefore he has the title of Nuncio. Under the, over here, you have now diocese. This is where we are. And these can be archdiocese, C -E -C, or diocese. Archdiocese is a metropolitan. So we don't have this in Hong Kong. What well, we do, the archdiocese for Hong Kong is Guangdong, Canton. We actually are under Canton. Don't say anything out loud. But that's been for close to a century. Historically, the archbishop lived in, what, wait, wait, what's the city canton? In Guangzhou. Guangzhou. Guangzhou, yeah. So you're under here, the archbishop of Guangzhou, who lives in Guangdong. I think that's it, the province and the city. So there are about 11 dioceses under him, including Hong Kong but not Macau, because Macau had a whole different enucleation in the church. It came from the Portuguese empire. And so they, in Macau, up until recently, were under Lisbon. Very strange. Now I think they are also, well, no, they're independent. They are under nobody. But we are technically, in Hong Kong, if not in reality, under Canton. And it would say that if you look under Hong Kong in here, I have to find it. It's all alphabetical, but you have to know in the Chinese version, you have to know what they are really called by our standards, uh, which is very weird. But Hong Kong comes under H I J K K H J I H O N G. Getting there. Hong Kong, yeah, we're nothing. Hong Kong is so tiny. And the name is Xiangang. Xiangang, okay, whatever, however you say it in Mandarin. And it was erected on the 11th of April, 1946, with the title of Xiongxianensis. That's the Latin word for Hong Kong, the Chinese town. That's, Xiangxian is Chinese, and it is a, the Chinese town. That's what they call this. It was a vicariate apostolic of Hong Kong since 1874. Suffragan of Guangzhou, right there, were under the Archbishop of Guangzhou. And then the diocese and everything else. And then it has Bishop Nobody. That's interesting. Oh, that's right, because we only have an apostolic administrator. We have no bishop in Hong Kong because the cardinal is only an administrator. And because he's a cardinal, his name is somewhere else in the book. So in a little fact, I didn't, I didn't even look at that yet. OK, any questions about that? You're all under Canton. Um, not that, and, and that what this means is that if the Archbishop of Canton decide to come here for any reason, 
he is in charge, not in charge of the diocese, but he can call a meeting. Let me get to the, I'll show you where this is. The beauty of this crazy book. Conferences of bishops, yes. So here in Hong Kong, we don't have a conference of bishops because Hong Kong was separated politically from China. And officially, China, China, C-I-N-A in this book, does not have a conference. Aha, they do. In Taipei. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have the police at the door in a minute. <laughs> there is a conference, it's just not quite nearby. So th that's the first thing. And again, this is how we politically look at things. So what you have to then go to is look at where does, you go down here under Asia, there's a whole section of Asia here, and you have China Continentale, the continent of China. Okay, it's a big section, huge. Now with that, you go through what were the traditional archdiocese in Hong, in China. And the first one they put down here is an independent see under nobody, Macau. That's how they, they settled the question with Lisbon. They basically took it out of Lisbon and it's nothing. It lives in limbo or something. Then you have to go down, and so we're Guangzhou, Canton. And under that are, and I can't even pronounce them, Beihei, Pakhoi, Jiangmen, Kangmun, which was my order, Mexian, Kaiying, also my order, Shantao, Swatao, Xuqiao, Hong Kong, and uh, yeah, and uh, Gaiyang, Guayang. They, because we have two names for everything in my pronunciation of Cantonese was horrendous, but you get the idea. And so you have, those are the dioceses and archdioceses. And then you have what are called prefecture apostolics, which are not dioceses. They are, they have a lower rank. And then you have an apostolic administration, Harbin. Why? Harbin used to be part of Russia. I'm going to get myself in a lot of trouble. There was a point where the Russians stole whole sections of China, including where I lived. Khabarovsk was China. But they claimed that the emperor signed something. He didn't know what he did. And the Russians got everything east of the, um, what's the name of the river that went through Khabarovsk? Uh, not the Angara, the... Hmm. It's on the border river that divides Russia and China now. That river was both sides China. And the Russians claimed one side, and then they went and took the rest. And so Harbin, which is right up there, Harbin is, has the structure of a Russian Catholic diocese called an apostolic administration. Doesn't mean a thing, OK? So you now know where you fit in the church. When you go into Guangzhou, don't make a big deal saying, I belong here. <laughs> don't get yourselves in trouble. But, it's, it, but that, we once, at the funeral of Bishop Michael Yang, uh, two year, three years ago now, two years ago, there was a bishop. No one knew who he was. And all the priests were at the funeral. We're going, who is it? Who is it? And someone said to me, who do you think it is? I said, I think it's the Archbishop of Guangzhou. And they went, oh! It wasn't. It was actually a bishop from Taiwan. Just as bad. Uh, but nobody knew who he was. Uh, so anyway, th so th now, on the sheet, you'll have, on this side, it goes diocese, parish, local, uh, and that's where we fit. We're a parish. You belong to a parish community. On the other side, on the uh, where you have uh, all these other positions, these are the official positions of rule. So I belong to the tribunal of the ecclesiastical diocese of Hong Kong, 
which means I am a judge attached to the court of Hong Kong, which is the court for all of China. Right now, we are the only court full-time functioning because we have <coughs> judges and lawyers. We do cases for the mainland, but it's very, very difficult. And there are now more and more priests from the mainland studying canon law. I, a friend of mine who was behind me in law school is from Shenyang, and he just graduated with his degrees on his way back. Um, so they're, they're beginning to try to reestablish the tribunal systems in China. But right now, there isn't much there. You have um, in the diocese here, on the idea of rule, every diocese has to have a financial officer. And every diocese has to have a financial um, commission. And the bishop cannot sell or buy property on his own. He has to get a consultation. And it has to be one that's done publicly where there is a vote. So the bishop is the one who does, in the name of the diocese, buy property and sell property. But it has to be done in consultation. Uh, is that clear? So it's not an arbitrary decision. The sale of property in law is, in, in, in canon law, there's a whole chapter on property and property rights. And so no bishop actually owns anything. It's all by the diocese and the diocesan name. Uh, the bishop has consultors, and he must listen to his consultors when he makes certain decisions. He cannot just make them. He has to ask their advice. It's advice and consent. There are a few cases where he needs their explicit consent. In other ones, he can simply just listen to them and disagree. He's the bishop. Uh, and th I think that's it. Uh, the rest of it is not important. So I'm going to end here. I'm going to thank everyone and turn off the camera and then I'll take some questions. Thanks very much.